Welcome back, creeps. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Everyone. Welcome back for part two of number 91. A Belfast ghost story. Yes. I also probably forgot to mention last week that this is actually by the author of this book, who is also the protagonist. I forgot what that word meant. Yeah, me too. Basically, it's a first hand written account and the author is John Skillen. And it's John and his family that are the experiencers. Yeah, it, the protagonist is the main character of something. Right on. Then what's an antagonist? I don't know. Oh, it's the adversary. Okay. okay. Like so the like enemy. the villain. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So. So this week on How To Grammar. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I thought I didn't, we'd always use main character and then they bust out a fancy word and I'm like, oh no, is there like a third kind of main character? I don't fucking know. I don't know. Either way, this is Weekly Creep, by the way. Oh, <laughs> That's hey. probably the worst intro we've ever done. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. Uh, I did not hit her. I did, I did not. not. So anyway, our patron of the week this week is Sarah H. from the UK. Big shout out to Sarah. Hello, Sarah H. We very much appreciate your patronage. Yes. And uh, Patronus, expecto patronum. We respect you. <laughs> so yeah, I don't think we have any other news really this week. Mm. Uh, My hair is getting longer. That's some news. Yep. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is a double creep week, so we will have the listener story coming out tomorrow. As you guys are hearing this, is going to be out on the first, and this month. We actually are going to have to do two listeners episodes because we got quite a handful and they're like nice juicy ones as well. So that's what she said. Hey, so if you wrote in and we don't cover you on tomorrow's episode, don't cover your story. Don't worry. There's one coming out probably on the 14th or 15th. And yeah, I think I'm going to go straight into this. Yeah, please. I can't wait to hear what happened next. Right. So a brief little catch up. We left off last week with John, Greta and a bunch of merry men going back to the house to teach this woman a lesson, <laughs> which left them all on the street with their tails between their legs. Again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You know, you could say he went in there with a bunch of Marys. <laughs> ah, I get it. Hey. <laughs> Whatever, it was... I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> it was as though John needed his own reminder of just how violent this entity was. Oh, and yeah. if you didn't listen to last week's episode, do yourself a favor and go back because, well, I, just because it's, yeah, this is only a second here? half of the story, you know? Anyway, one thing I will say is that the first few chapters were broken on, it broken into um, like days and dates. But from here on out, I'm not actually sure how much time has passed since like the first appearance of the woman. Mm hmm. But we're still within like two or three weeks of the first event. So it's around late June or July of 1989. The morning after their showdown, which is what they called that last uh, experience. Yeah. Skirmish with the lady or the woman. John and Greta called back over to check on Barney, the next door neighbor, who had gotten into the house with them the night before. Uh, apparently he was like a rather big man with a bad heart and so like they genuinely were worried about his uh, physical health after like getting such a bad shock but he was fine he tells them that after they left himself and his wife sadie heard all sorts of noises coming from the house like all night no let up whatsoever he was actually concerned for their for their possessions and all the shit that they'd left in the house and said that they'd want to go in and have a look at the place. Greta says, okay, I'll go in because just the thoughts of this woman fucking around with all her stuff is like, she's just pissed off at this stage. It's, there's no fear left. It's like, fuck okay. it. I'm going to go in and take a look. Sadie 
and another another neighbor who just happened to be there say they'll go in and give her a hand the entity seems to not go for women anyway mm-hmm. and it's daylight so they're like fuck it john barney and barney's son all stood outside watching through the window the place was absolute chaos all the furniture had been flipped over and thrown about into the center of the room like each individual room specifically Mm. yeah pictures and ornaments were all over the place and the three ladies then went walked up the stairs but just peeked through the banisters and could see that all the beds and all the rooms had also been dragged into the center of each room Mm. then they started screaming and i'm sorry if i seem like i'm blasting through this but i feel like there's a lot to cover still so Barney and his son ran up, telling John to stay where he was. But I don't think John was had any intent of going back into the house anyway. Yeah. What happened was when Greta looked into one of the rooms, she saw the shape of a person lying on the bed. An invisible person. Yeah. So they went in to have like a proper look. Because, you know, I guess that could happen, you know, if somebody had recently been in the bed. Oh, so there was like an in, an, an indent, indent, yeah, indent, indentation, yeah. like. But as they get closer to it, the shape moves as if this invisible person is getting up off wow. of the bed, and then they feel this coldness pass right by them, and like I have written here, I can picture this like a scene from one of the Conjuring movies or something. Yeah, yeah, like so vivid and detailed. And John said, like rightly so, that this thing was purely making a point of doing this in front of them, like mm-hmm. purposely just to scare the shit out of them because it's not like they just caught it having a quick 15 fucking minute nap or anything. Yeah. Like, this thing can 100% control who sees it, when they see it. And yeah, so it was purposely done. I have a question. Okay. Just, it's not really relevant, but... I kind of wasn't expecting it to be relevant. <laughs> I thought you roll your eyes. <laughs> You're like, oh, here we go. Okay, so you know how, like, to us, if we saw that shit, we'd be like, wow, that's fucking scary. Like, I'm going to leave. Yeah. You know, it's making me afraid to see this shit because it's like, wow, look what it can do. Yeah. Right? Do other like say there was another ghost in the house would the other ghost look at this ghost and be like all right you're fucking taking the piss now like this is like stop showing off yeah you know what i'm saying or like maybe like to that ghost it's also scary (laughs) it's not even like laying down it's watching the other ghosts with her hand make the indention with her hand you know what i mean (laughs) And he's just, like, looking at her like, God, you're a fucking nerd. You know what I mean? Like, something like that. Maybe. I feel in this house specifically, there's only one entity. And it's the woman. And she can just do whatever the fuck she wants. Yeah, I know. But But I'm saying, like, suppose there was. I I don't know. We'd have to find a ghost and ask them. Like, I wonder if in that ghost plane... There's an, there could have been, like, when there's a house full of them, like, ghosts, there, it's just like a house of, like, frat boys or girls, and they're just, like, pulling pranks on other people, and they're just like, oh, that's so funny, or, oh, that's so fucking lame, what you're doing right now. Kind of like Beetlejuice. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, no, I know. Uh, when I was serving my time as an apprentice, mm-hmm. And I first went to like my first stint in like college to learn about like, like electricity. I was told by one of the lecturers, sometimes you're better off not asking why and just knowing the answer, but not knowing why the answer has to happen. Basically, I was asking too many questions that he didn't have the answer for. He said, look, this is the answer. I don't know why this happens. But this is what happens. And I'm going to give you the same answer right now because we need to get through this. That sounds like an answer a priest would give. Yeah, pretty much. During sermons. Yeah. Or, I don't know. know why. It just is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. So anyway, they saw this fucking invisible thing walk past and felt it the whole lot. And 
in a move to like gain some control back over the house, Greta and the other ladies put everything back the way it was before. They agreed to let the house sit empty for a while and not to keep poking at it. And Barney, the next door neighbor, said he'll pop in every now and then, and if shit's out of place, he'll sort it all back to t- put it all back together because he is the one being kept up and hearing the woman making all this noise every night. So if he hears this, he'll go in, check, clean it up, whatever. This was only one of their problems, however. And right now I'm going to read from the book. A lot of the time I'm going to be reading from the book. So if I'm talking in the first person, it's because I'm reading from the book. It's not because of my personal experience. Pressure was growing on another front. Danny now had four of our children living with him and Sandra. Although he never complained, I knew that we were in his way. The house was small and on a wet day we would all be crushed into the tiny living room. As well as this, Greta had to try to feed them all. The kids were missing a settled home life and Greta and I longed for something that would help us out of this predicament. All we wanted was our family back together again with a normal home. As an example of how bad things were, it was not unusual for us to take the kids for a walk up to the local leisure centre. There, we would sit on the grass while one or another of the kids would be sent to the local chip shop for a carryout. That means takeaway. Mm. It was a terrible feeling to sit there and watch my kids eating their supper out of, a, out of paper in the open air. Greta was often reduced to tears and I was never far from crying myself. On other days, we would use the seats in the local shopping centre. We would sit there for hours, feeling miserable and left out. I was aware of Greta watching other people doing their shopping. We could see families out together, sisters shopping for pleasure, wives with their husbands, laughing and joking with their kids. I knew that Greta was missing the company of her own sisters. Once they had been very close, but now she felt left out in the cold. She was alone and helpless. She had no home. Her kids were walking the streets, a spectacle for everyone to see, but no one was willing to pull her out of that nightmare. So Danny and Sandra, who are Greta's niece, or Greta's nephew and, her, and his wife, they had made a habit of making themselves scarce on a Saturday. Basically, they would go over to like Danny's dad's house or something and spend the day there. But like they were literally being, they were being pushed out of their own homes mm-hmm. to facilitate John, Greta and their kids. Yeah. And also to get some fucking peace from their four kids as, as well, I'm sure. This would give John, Greta and the kids a chance to feel like relatively normal again for a few hours. And it would also give Danny and Sandra some peace and quiet. But still, this situation was putting a strain on everyone. John and Greta knew it too, but they just felt so helpless. The local newspaper reached out and asked if they could spend the night in the house. Two journalists and a photographer. They agreed to this because... Again, they thought the publicity would help get them rehoused like sooner or at least give their case a little more credibility. They scheduled for 9.30 the following Thursday and Barney, the next door neighbor, called them because John and Greta were at Town Margaret's, their friend's house. Sorry, just to fucking bring everybody back up to speed again. So they get a call from Barney saying... That they're only after showing up now. It's 11 o'clock. And also I think they're drunk. So John, Greta. The news people? The news people, yeah. So John, Greta and Danny's wife Sandra. All went back over to number 91 to have a chat with them. Turns out they'd been in the pub. And they were already fairly hammered. And had more drink with them. Like they were completely taking the piss out of this whole situation. And John, Greta and Sandra just like left because they were like, John felt he was going to start an argument, but he already knew that this was going to be a fucking farce. Like the following day, they checked in on the house only to find empty vodka bottles and glasses all over the place. Their holy pictures were removed from the walls, lying face down on the floor. And Greta's asthma pills were just left like strewn all over the bathroom floor. What the fuck? Yeah, so people said, like, maybe the woman did all this because it wouldn't be the first time. But then the story the journalist published claimed that the whole thing was a load of bollocks, uh, like just a big old hoax. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. like they made a joke out of the whole thing and made John and Greta out to be total fucking nut jobs. And the Friday night after, remember the journalist and that had been there the Thursday, the following night, the woman was back to her old tricks, wrecking the place again on her own this time. So John took this as a sign from her just to like trying to humiliate him even further, like as if she knew that these people were here on his behalf kind of thing. And she wasn't going to let them see her acting up. Well, we kind of expect that. Remember? Well, I mean, yeah. It's home, it's, what I think is fucking weird, because just in the last episode, I was like, I think it's really weird how it's not trying to isolate John. But when it comes to this shit, she's like, no, I'm going to isolate you. Yeah. It, it's kind of weird, isn't it? But I do think that... Very selective almost. Yeah, I do think that he was being isolated. It's just that he was surrounded by so many witnesses. Mm. that they all knew what what he was going through or could at least see the most part of it but this i think did show like signs of she was very manipulative you know Mm. and knew what it was doing like we keep saying she and calling it the woman but really we don't know what the fuck it is the kids also were really starting to show effects of like their new lifestyle they were pale losing weight uh not sleeping properly at all Like, they were just traumatized. Quote, John, our oldest boy, had broken out in a nervous rash. He had been staying with Jim and Martine in a house that was quite near to our house, and we felt that he was still within the woman's sphere of influence. Although Jim and Martine couldn't have treated John any better, it was still taking a nervous toll on their health. John himself was so nervous he was now suffering from a speech impediment. We were going to have to bring John back to himself, but it would take us a long time to get his confidence back. Indeed, we knew that all of our children were going to need a lot of attention, but with things being the way they were, it was impossible for them to get the attention they deserved. And so John, the eldest fella, I think was 16. So still like, still a kid, you know? Yeah. Greta really wasn't doing well herself either. So the, the pills being scattered all over the floor, that's the first mention of her having asthma. Mm-hmm. If that was the woman's doing, it was almost like a warning or an omen of what was to come. One evening, she had an asthma attack so bad that John said every time she tried to take a breath, she would turn so blue that her face almost went black. Prediction. Prediction? Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh. hey, poor Funnily enough, though, John helped her downstairs to make her a bit more comfortable, but it wasn't until their friend Margaret came down to see them that anybody actually called an ambulance. John was just kind of sitting there watching her. Go from one color to the next. Yeah, like, what? So John was just waiting. Maybe he was in shock. I don't fucking know. I just thought it was weird and worth mentioning. Anyway, the ambulance rushed her to the hospital and they managed to calm her down and get her sorted, but they would have to keep her in for observation. She was terrified of spending the night alone and visitors were not allowed, like after hours. But when John spoke with the head nurse, she actually had recognized their names and address off the the sign-in sheet Mm -hmm. that she had been given. And she was basically scared and she just said, yeah, okay, you can stay. Just be quiet. Uh, Just don't send your demon on me. Yeah. So sometime after like 2.30 that morning, John went out for a cigarette assuring Greta that he would be back. He even like left his jacket behind on the chair just to comfort her. He goes down, he makes a couple of calls and Greta's sister comes in straight away to see her. And, you know, that like helped again, relax her and kind of cheer her up a bit. The following morning, John went home to let the kids know the crack and get clothes for Greta and, you know, whatever else. That was around 930 and he returned that afternoon. He found two of Greta's sisters there, but said that they were more or less just completely ignoring Greta, talking amongst themselves. Meanwhile, Greta was hysterical beside them, could barely breathe, was hooked up to a mask and was trying to convince, trying to get somebody to let her sign herself out. Like, Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, these two women were just sat there chatting away. Weird. That's the scene that he made out. Anyway, I guess John had to leave again to go back and like sort the kids get them dinner or whatever and he came back that evening to meet his own sister there 
because she was going to take him from the hospital back to her house to spend the night. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they got Greta, like, calmed down and relaxed. And she he said, like, she was even, like, in good spirits. Mm -hmm. And then they went back to John's sister's house. John was exhausted at this stage. He didn't sleep the whole night before. He just sat beside Greta in the bed and was doing all this running around. So when he got home, his sister went to make him something to eat. It's about 1130 at night and he's getting ready to go to bed. And then the sister's phone rings and it's Greta. She's on her way over to them. She just signed herself out and was about to jump into a taxi. She said that after John and his sister left her, she had dozed. After a while, she heard voices coming from the top of the ward. She recognized the nurses and the doctor talking among themselves. Greta heard her name being mentioned and the fact that she lived in a so-called haunted house. At first, she didn't mind being discussed because people were always curious about the house and she had gradually become used to it. But then odd things began to happen. The voices spread themselves out around the ward and began to make strange noises. She could hear them walking about her bed, standing at the head of it and opening and closing books, rustling papers and whispering among themselves. Then someone would drop something and make a noise on the other side of the ward. She lay there in complete shock and horror. Then, as she sat up, the doctor approached. He was dressed all in white. He was even wearing a white hat on his head and white boots on his feet. Then the nurses burst into a fit of giggles, having a great time at Greta's expense. Greta then demanded that someone should bring her the forms so she could sign herself out. The doctor brought them, and although earlier he had tried to talk her out of leaving the hospital, this time he seemed determined to get her out, even though it meant that she was leaving in the early hours of the morning, despite the fact that it was very cold and Greta didn't have any outdoor clothes. They just let her walk out into the night all alone and find herself a taxi. So, after hearing this completely strange, like, fucking fever dream experience, yeah, John wanted to go back to the hospital and cause fucking murder. Mm-hmm. And find this white booted doctor. But Greta and his sister managed to calm him down. And anybody that knows that causing a fuss in a hospital is not a good look for fucking anybody. No matter what the situation. Yeah. But what the fuck was Greta going through? Like she sounds positively delirious. Yeah, she does. I feel like um, they're both delirious at this point. I think it's like between stress and lack of sleep. And also like this asthma attack court like was more or less brought on by stress as well. Yeah. I think that makes sense, especially like what you said about when he left Greta there with her sisters, it just sounded like he hated his sisters and either wanted to make them look shitty by like saying, Oh yeah, they were ignoring them and she's over here asking for help. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or he's just fucking tired and irate. Possibly. Um, and now John had also mentioned like the night before while he was sitting there beside Greta, once the lights were dimmed down and stuff like that, he had started to see things in the shadows, like starting to move and stuff. But he said it himself, like it was just his mind playing tricks on him. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe this was like another form of like whatever this power, this entity had over them. But I do. I am more inclined to believe that it was just sleep and stress induced. Yeah. The whole fucking episode. I have to agree with you on that one. John and Greta go back to Ta and Margaret's house, which is basically their home for the time being. And they arranged a house call from Greta's doctor, who came across as extremely angry with the whole situation going on in the hospital and said that she was going to look into it. This, unfortunately, is another thing that just gets forgotten about in the book. So we don't find out. She gives Greta some new meds and orders bed rest. Margaret took charge, put Greta in her own bed, cooked meals for her and John, and just made her as comfortable as possible. They even, that night, they even like they lit the fire, they brought Greta downstairs, had her sit up, watching telly and that with the kids all called over and all, and it was like a really nice, cozy evening. Ta and Margaret fucked off to the pub or wherever and gave them some space. While all this is going on, John just starts feeling super, super down. And just angry. 
So the whole family's having a fucking great time, except for him. Mm-hmm. He put it down to exhaustion, like not just from the last couple of nights, but f- like he was still suffering like from horrific um, night terrors. So again, he just hadn't slept in weeks at this stage. Mm-hmm. So he decided to take some sleeping tablets that a doctor had prescribed him a few weeks previous. But like any stereotypical man of that time in particular, I'm not taking those tablets. Put them in the uh, bathroom cupboard and forgot about them until now. You still do that. Yeah, I do. Yeah, that's toxic trait right there. Um, So anyway, he took three and then went back to sit down in the living room. He was also drinking. I don't know how heavily or anything, but having a few beers anyway. With sleeping pills, that's a good idea. Yeah. So Ta and Margaret soon returned and joined them all. They were in great form, seeing the kids being happy and all, I guess, just perked everyone up, except John. And seeing everybody is happy made him even angrier. <laughs> he went back and took three more tablets what? before it was time to go to bed. I guess the first three hadn't worked. So he was like, fuck it, I'll take three more, get a good night's sleep. But he said, like, he was actually dreading the thoughts of even just lying in bed. Like, anybody who suffers from any sort of mental health issues or anything knows that when it comes time for bed, if you can't sleep and you're just alone with your thoughts, everything starts to play up. Like, you know, what if this happened? What if that happened? So the fact that this now all he's thinking about is how am i gonna house my kids this fucking ghost keeps punching me in the head every time i get over there yeah so he was afraid to even lie down and try to go to sleep when greta woke up the next morning she found john completely unresponsive he was still breathing just totally unwakeable she was trying to wake him up when with his eyes still closed he got up and tried to make his way to the bathroom but he was a stumbling mess. Greta called Margaret, who ran next door to get her son-in-law to come in and help him. And this man managed to, like, kind of walk John into the toilet and get him to go or whatever, and then get him back into the bedroom where Greta started dressing him. And someone called an ambulance. Around six o'clock that evening, not knowing where he was or why he was there, John wakes to this strange sight. There was two unknown women standing over him with crosses in their hands, saying prayers and talking about angels and devils. They proceeded to place the cross on John's chest when they saw he woke up, just to see if he would react at all. He didn't, thankfully. His and Greta's family had all come in to check on him during the day, but most of them had gone by now. They probably had been told by the doctor that he just needed to sleep. That's what I'm saying. Like, why don't you just let the guy sleep? Well, they, he didn't tell anyone that he had taken these tablets the night before. Do you know oh. what I mean? So they didn't know what was fucking wrong until mm-hmm. they got him to the hospital. Anyway, Cecil, the psychic, and his friend Anne, they had also come. They had stayed there all day, in fairness to them. But because they weren't the media family, they weren't allowed actually on the ward. They were just sitting in a waiting room. And when John woke up and it was time to go, they accompanied him back to Tan Margaret's house. Cecil was trying to find out why he had taken the pills and concluded that these nightmares were the big issue. So they decided to go back to the house. Number 91. Cecil and Anne wanted to communicate with the woman. They were still very much of the opinion that she was just a lost, misunderstood spirit and they wanted to help her. They assured John that they would stay on either side of him the whole time they were in the house. They went there, just the three of them this time, so as not to attract any attention. There was no crowd gathered on the street or anything. I think like the hype had kind of worn off at this stage. The house was in complete darkness. There was no, still no electricity, so they lit candles in the living room. After a few quiet moments, the candles started flickering like mad. And John says he feels the woman in the room. Cecil and Anne are still very calm. And Anne is trying to debunk things. Like she's trying to find the breeze that may be affecting the candles. While Cecil points out that like the temperature hasn't dropped or anything. But John is convinced that the woman is standing right beside him. 
it's as if she's doing a recon, you know, trying to suss out who's here, what's going on, what are they trying to do, and like see what she's up against. Cecil tries to get John to just sit on the couch beside him and chill the fuck out, and after a while the atmosphere goes back to normal. John suggests making a break for it now while they have the chance, but Cecil and Anne have other plans. They tell him they want her to show up. They need her to show up if they're going to get anything done. Also, it's time to go upstairs. And so they went. John, sandwiched between Anne and Cecil, Anne leading the way with one of the candles from the living room. When they got to the landing, they noticed the curtains moving behind them. The woman was actually following them. So they had assumed that when it felt as if the woman had left the living room, that she had done her usual retreat back upstairs, which is where she always seems to appear, first of all. Like, that seems to be her area. Mm -hmm. But she was actually more cunning than that. You know, it's almost like a fucking animal instinct. Like, you know, she's hiding in the house, like, following them around, blah, blah, blah. Cecil tries to reach out to her mentally, and pretty soon the candle in Anne's hand starts flickering again. The temperature dropped, and John noticed that Anne was cold to the touch, although her face was flush as if she had a fever. Cecil informed John that that's just what happened when Anne goes into the silence. I love it. Yeah, right, me too. I thought that was so fucking cool. That's just what they call, I guess, like the lobby between our realm and the spirit world. Yeah. And that's where they make these connections with spirits. I'm really bad at defining things, but that's basically what they meant. Cecil and Anne were having a fucking whale of a time. Like, they were in their absolute element. John was not. He was getting himself worked up to the point where Anne was like, come on, we'll go back downstairs and, like, maybe John can relax. But they need him there as, like, bait, almost. She led the way, with John following close behind again. But when Cecil gets down a few steps, something grabs him by the shirt and won't let go. Now, it's not like a violent, like, it's not trying to rip him back up the stairs or anything, but it stops him dead in his tracks. Mm -hmm. And he shouts out, he's like, uh, like, it's not letting me go downstairs. We need to go back up. She wants us up there. So they go, they slowly go back. Cecil, I'm pretty sure, is actually walking backwards because this thing is still holding on to him. Yeah. As soon as they reach the landing, whatever it is, let's go of him. And he's like, okay, it seems pretty shaken up but trying to keep a brave face. And while they're there, they notice that the bathroom door is like opening and closing by itself. It doesn't say whether it was like slamming or anything or just moving really fucking slowly. But it got me thinking like, which is worse? In my head, like a slow, steady, purposeful motion is like way fucking freakier in this circumstance, right? Yeah. Cecil goes to see what the deal is with this door. He tells Anne, stick with John. I'll go over here. Like, I'm sure these landings are fairly small anyway, but he's like, I'll go over and check this out. It's still moving, like, the whole time he's approaching it. And he literally has his arm outstretched to grab the handle. And as soon as he touches it, he's frozen in place. He literally looks as though he's, like, after suffering from a stroke. One whole half of his body is just completely paralyzed. And he's like struggling to get words out. It's so bizarre. Yeah. Like I think John and Anne like actually thought he had had a stroke on mm -hmm. the fucking spot. Anne is still like cool as a cucumber. And they reckon like this is just a plan to get them away from John so that she can attack them, attack John again. Cecil struggles with this for a few seconds and then eventually he gets back over to join them on the landing and he's just back brand new. Like. Like, no stroke. Okay. You know, he, he's fully functioning again. Yeah. I think, anyway. And John's still trying to convince them to leave. He's like, look, she's doing all this. We need to get the fuck out of here. But they still think that this is all working in their favor. I see. I don't know why, but anyway. So Anne starts to say how they can't go back downstairs because the woman wants them here for a reason. When she's suddenly cut off because the curtain starts to move again, as if someone is just swinging out of it. 
like back and forth. Like to me, this is so fucking freaky. Then comes the cold draft that usually accompanies the woman. Only this time, it's literally surrounding them on the landing, completely encompassing them. And then there she was. This time, however, instead of looking like a real three-dimensional person, her image appeared on the wall that faced us. It just showed her from the shoulders up. A strange expression was on her face, one I hadn't seen before. Not anger, something less straightforward, hard to put my finger on. She stared at us as if in wonder. I said nothing to the others about seeing her. I wanted to see if they could see her too. For too long, I had been the only one to actually lay eyes on her. I prayed to God that Cecil and Anne could see her too. I could sense Anne shifting restlessly beside me. Don't worry, John, she said. I can see it as well. I know what it is you're looking at. Oh yeah? Then where is she, and what does she look like? To my relief, she pointed out her position easily and described her exactly right down to the expression on her face. Anne described it as a sad, solemn sort of expression, one that was looking for help. Cecil couldn't see her, but he said he felt her there and was trying to communicate once again, but to no avail. Eventually, she just faded and was gone. They decided to go back down to the living room and tried to make another attempt at contacting her. Cecil had been frightened pretty badly earlier with this whole stroke business but he still seems convinced that their plan is working. Whereas, to me, like I just said, it seems quite clear that the woman has total control. Yeah. Although she definitely seems a little, like, watered down compared to before. Yeah. Upon entering the living room, John wrote, I couldn't believe my eyes. The candles were blowing and flickering wildly. Two of them guttered out even as we watched. There was another strange phenomenon too. A green light was flickering on the ceiling. It looked as if someone was flashing the beam of a torch around in circles. These are coloured lights. This is a spirit manifestation to help us and to help the spirit that you see. The green globe of light was about the size of a tennis ball and it bobbed in the air about three or four inches from the ceiling. As we watched, it slowly disappeared into the ceiling, directly under the spot where the face had shown itself on the wall. Before it completely disappeared, another globe appeared. This was a gold-coloured one, and it moved much faster, but it too entered the ceiling at the spot directly below the landing. As we watched, doors opened and closed. They weren't being slammed. It was as if they were being moved by a strong but firm breeze. So they stood there in awe of what was going on. The breeze that was causing the candles to flicker got stronger and stronger but the candles that it hadn't already blown out stayed like that was the only light that they had Mm -hmm. so it was like purposefully doing this yeah john didn't like this one bit but they sat him on the couch and prayed over him before they finally left i feel i think they felt like this was their spirit guides or something like that and I just I thought that was particularly interesting because I've seen lights like that, the way he describes like the beam of a torch. Mm-hmm. But like without the actual beam, you know what I mean? It's like hard to describe like the circle of light without the beam reaching it. It's I, like a completely standalone thing. Yeah. I've only ever heard mention of like balls of light, different colored light. Yeah. In uh, UFO testimonies. Yeah, well, again, all these things are fucking linked, aren't they? Aye. Aye. When they got outside, Cecil made John touch him. (laughs) All right. Whoa. He was soaking wet, completely drenched in sweat from the physical toll that that this had taken on him. They both admitted to John that at times in there, they were both shitting bricks, but they'd done all they could. Anne and Cecil, that is. They confided in John that in their past experiences, literally all they had to do was make a connection with the spirit. I, I, in my head, I just hear Cecil saying, touch me, John. I'm wet. <laughs> Whereas in my head, I, I'm like, I can hear him going, go on, touch that, touch that. See how wet that is. I swear to God, I've been in there fighting for the light. Um, 
Just men being men with men. <laughs> <laughs> Just having a manly time with my other men. So yeah, they confided in John that in their past experiences, literally all they had to do was make a connection with the spirit. And that was it. That, that was all that was needed to get it to like move on or at least stop like haunting or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But that, that was all their job ever entailed before. This time they were like perplexed and they pretty much admitted defeat. When they got back to Ta and Margaret's house, they found Greta waiting up for them. They told her everything that had gone on. Anne and Cecil said that they would be more than happy to help John and Greta, like spiritually, anytime. But as far as their business with the house goes, they were done. Cecil left them with this final message. Someday there could be a terrible tragedy in that house. I don't want to be reading about you in the newspapers. Take my advice and stay well away from it. That's pretty grim. <laughs> But they just Thanks assume, yeah, for nothing. <laughs> oh, stay away from the house. That's okay. Yeah, sound. Thanks. Literally trying to get rehomed. Yeah, <laughs> but thanks anyway. The following day, they heard from neighbors that the noises coming from the house after they left were like just every time they just keep getting worse and worse and worse. Things have been thrown around. The doors being slammed all night. So they went over there and some of the neighbors opened the door and had a look around downstairs. John, That's what she said. Hey. <laughs> had a look around downstairs. There wasn't much there. Uh, <laughs> John and Greta just peered in from the front door, but like the place was just a fucking wreck. In every room, again, all the furniture had been flipped over and piled up in the center of the room. But this time all their clothes and pictures and whatever else had also been added to the piles too like this thing had emptied the drawers and then piled all the clothes on top like just being an asshole it was almost like he it's like i'll help you pack yeah, yeah. here, here are your all shit. your shit here's yeah. all your shit this time nobody ventured upstairs after hearing the goings on of the night previous they were like nah fuck that Two of the neighbors off the street called into Tan Margaret's later on that day to let, or a few days after this, but once, once upon a time, two of the neighbors off the street called into Tan Margaret's house to let John and Greta know that they were going to go to St. Paul's, the local church, and they were basically going to beg one of the priests like to come back and actually try and fucking help them. Like, they've just been abandoned. Yeah. The whole neighborhood was suffering. Kids, and I'm sure more than a few adults that like just weren't mentioning it, were like not sleeping at night. They were all just waiting on this thing to show up in their own house. Or they were fucking looking across the street and seeing like lights turn on in the middle of the night and shadows walking past windows mm. and hearing all the noises coming from the, the house. So the atmosphere had taken over like the whole place. Like remember as well, they were saying that like kids used to hang out on this street and in the summertime, like, there'd be just constantly people on the street until, like, well after midnight, just having the crack. But all that was gone now. Yeah. So everything just seemed, like, dark and fucking somber. And they just wanted it dealt with. The priest's answer was no. He said, I feel I can offer no help on the house. I don't have the strength or power to oust this thing from your life. Evil never sleeps. And it's food and drink is not our food and drink. Father O'Donnell, I must admit, is the only priest on the local scene who would have had who would have stood any chance with this thing, which is why he was allowed to have a free hand in the matter. Mm. But nobody's questioning why they're not going further than the local priest scene. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like surely by now they could go to a fucking bishop or something. But again, I think all these priests were like, they're just living a cushy little life. You know, they have women at their disposal, children, probably a lot of them. And they're getting their money every week. They don't want hassle from the bishops and stuff like that. So basically, they're just saying, nah, fuck off. Yeah. So meanwhile. It's, it's very Father Ted. But they, yeah, literally. They don't want to see the bishop. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm not calling my boss down here because exactly. he's going to start giving me shit over everything else. Yeah. 
Like all the And then paperwork. it'll give me shit for calling them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Meanwhile, these living situations hadn't changed and everyone was fighting each other. Sick of the whole thing by now. So one evening, like John and Greta were just bickering and bickering and bickering. And they ended up having a big blowout and John went for a walk to cool down. Naturally, he ends up back at number 91. He kicked the door open like fucking someone who kicks doors open. Yeah, I was like, (laughs) where are you going with this? (laughs) Bruce Willis. Let's go for Bruce Willis. All right. He kicks the door open. Oh, fucking John McClane. And he stood there staring into the darkness. When a neighbor strolled by, because of course a fucking neighbor strolls by, it's a fucking <laughs> conveyor belt of a street. <laughs> and the neighbor says, don't go in. It's been carrying on something fierce the last few nights. Just like that. Yeah. So, and John took his advice, turned around, went back home to Greta, and they all lived happily ever after. Not. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that was terrible. That was way funnier in my head and on my notes. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, he went into the living room and sat on the arm of a chair, head in his hands, and heard a strange noise in the darkness. The room wasn't totally dark. With the lamplight filtering in from the street, I could make out the blocky shapes of furniture, but no details. Then, to my horror, one of the armchairs on the other side of the room started to slide along the floor. I watched with my eyes starting out of my head as the chair backed towards the wall. When it reached the wall, it couldn't go any further in that direction, so it moved in another. It turned over on its side and lay there. Then the settee erupted into movement. A settee is a couch or a sofa, just in case people didn't know. It was flung bodily towards the fireplace, like a whole couch just getting fucked towards the fireplace. Noises followed hard on the heel of this and the temperature plummeted. All of this happened so quickly that I didn't have any time to react. I could only sit there, open-mouthed, and watch in amazement. It took a moment or two for realisation to sink through to me, but once I realised what was happening, I knew I had to get out of there. I got up and turned for the door, but before I could do more than take a step, something grabbed hold of my foot. Whatever it was, it felt very strong but at least it felt like a human hand. Then another grip fastened on me, on my upper arm this time. The fingers closed like a vice, digging in deep enough to draw blood. I was caught in an awkward stance, with little in the way of leverage, but all the same I pulled with all my strength. My foot broke free, but the grip on my arm grew stronger, the blood trickling down the inside of my arm. Then the second grip was fixed on my leg. This time it didn't squeeze. The invisible nails were tugged down my leg with a stinging sensation, gouging the skin, tearing my socks. I shouted out for help, even though I knew there was no one to hear. I had a fleeting hope that maybe Greta or Ta would have followed me, but our argument had been bad this time and I had deeply hurt Greta. Jerk. (laughs) While I fought in the invisible grip, I knew I was trapped. I tried lashing out at my captor, swinging my arms wildly, aiming at where a body might be, but there was nothing to hit. All I could say was, Jesus help me, Jesus help. Then I managed to break free. I got to the door, but it wouldn't open. I turned, the ha- I turned on the handle and tugged and tugged. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I was waiting for that. <laughs> but it wouldn't give. Then I felt this presence behind me that was laughing at me sneering at my antics to get away from it. The room was terrifyingly cold and my hair was standing up on end and I felt that my heart would burst with fear at any moment. Then, the door opened and I was able to hurl myself out onto the street. As I ran off, I heard the door banging shut behind me. He ran all the way back to Tan Margaret's house and up the stairs to Greta. When he finally calmed down, he was able to see the damage the thing had done. He saw that his socks were torn and ripped, and the scratches on his shin were so deep that you could almost see bone. Oh, shit. Greta was trying to convince him to go to the hospital, but I think he was genuinely afraid of being committed if he did. 
um like what would happen if he showed up and started saying oh I yeah. got like the ghost the ghost that got me yeah he could have been like oh it was a rake someone attacked me with a rake <laughs> yeah and then he would have believed someone would have believed him um instead he like convinced greta look i'll clean all the wounds myself like i'll look after him but instead he lay there all night afraid to go to sleep and too tired to even like tend to his own fucking wounds one thing he said though was that obviously like they needed a new place to live but he came to the conclusion that it would have to be much further away because he would just keep being drawn back to the house otherwise yeah like no matter what so he knew himself maybe in hindsight i don't know but that he had this like attachment or draw to the place the following day they checked in on the house before going to see the kids and Greta couldn't even make it past the hall before leaving. She said she felt as though this thing was just waiting for her, you know, mm-hmm. watching her from the corner of the room. On another occasion, shortly after this, John and Greta were visiting Greta's other friend, Margaret, and her sister. Nope. On another occasion, shortly after this, John and Greta were visiting Greta's, friend, Greta's other friend, Margaret, and her sister. They couldn't get over all that had happened to them and they wanted to go and see the house for themselves. The house was, you could see number 91 from Greta's friend's house. Mm -hmm. And John refused to go. He was like, no, he literally still had the fucking wounds on him. But Greta said she'd take them over. They made it into the living room and were only there for a minute when one of Greta's friends was picked up and thrown across the room. They all fought each other to get back out the door and came running back to the house where John was waiting. I would imagine that they all had a few drinks in them and Mm. that's how they convinced Greta. But John said, like, that's enough. That's the first time someone was attacked in the house while John wasn't there. And this thing just seems to keep getting stronger and stronger every time they go back. Nobody's to go back in that house. Ever, 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 absolutely no one. Ta and John went back a few nights later to have it out with this woman once and for all. Again. Again. (laughs) They sat smoking in the living room for about five minutes when they felt the temperature drop and the atmosphere start to change. It was different this time though. It didn't get quite as cold and the atmosphere wasn't all that bad. Then the woman walked into the room. She just stood there staring at John. That was all. The two of them locked eyes and John sensed no immediate danger like from the look on her face. Someone knocked on the front door and she vanished. It was Greta calling over to see how they were getting on. She wanted to be able to protect John like she used to or just help in any way. I started to describe my latest encounter when in walked the woman in black again. She entered in a very aggressive manner as if she was in a stamping rage and meant to settle things once and for all. But instead of a discussion, it was back to open fisticuffs. As soon as she entered, she made a grab for my neck. I dodged enough so that she only caught me by the side of my head. The contact was very brief, but her strength was such that she still sent my head bouncing off the wall. She tried to secure a better grip on me, but Ta and Greta surrounded me and protected me from her. At that, the woman vanished into thin air. I couldn't tell where she would... I couldn't tell where she had gone. Instead, I stood there, trembling. Ta said, we better get you out, John. So we all edged our way around the room, heading for the front door. I still couldn't see anything, so it was looking as if we could make our escape. Out in the hall, we were almost at the front door. Ta moved away far enough from me to open the door, and then the woman struck. I don't know where she came from, but I was pulled like a rag doll from between Greta and Ta and smashed against the wall. Once there, my head was grabbed and banged repeatedly off the wall. Ta managed to get the door open, but by this time, I was unconscious. Ta later told me that he shouted for help and within a minute, a dozen neighbours showed up to help us. Greta could only stand and scream in terror. All she could see was my body jerking with no visible agency to account for my strange actions. She described it later as if somebody invisible was standing there kicking at my body. 
Her only way to help was to climb on top of me in order to lend me some protection. Then the neighbours arrived and grabbed hold of my feet and pulled us both out into the street. I later learned from these neighbours that although there were five or six men pulling me, they found it very difficult to get me out into the street. They were fighting a force that was using my body as the rope in a grisly tug of war. In fact, the only way they got me out was when they felt the resistance depart. They could feel me being released. So that's the first time that John ever actually gets knocked unconscious by this thing. Yeah. Surprisingly, seeing as all it ever seems to do is fucking smack his head against the wall. Yeah. But when the neighbors did get him outside, they couldn't even get a pulse or anything. Like someone had to give him the fucking uh, kiss of life and everything trying to get him Mm. resuscitated. So they were convinced he was dead. All the while from the house behind them just came a load of bangs and slams so loud that even with the door shut, they could still hear it on the street. They said it sounded as if someone was just marching on like bare wooden floors, like running back and forth. John goes on to explain that all these futile attempts to reclaim their house were made out of just pure desperation. Their situation just seemed like positively permanent and tensions were only building. John had actually taken to walking the streets just looking for an empty or abandoned house. Anything that seemed half livable would do. He had contemplated taking the kids and trying to get the whole family into a hostel or a homeless shelter. He even felt so desperate that he thought at one point he would just burn the house down. Like several times this came to him like, fuck it, we'll just burn it down, forget all about it. But he just, he couldn't put the neighbours through this. The houses were all terraced, so like there's no way he could just burn his down. They were all connected, you know? Yeah. And in a lot of cases, like these older terraced houses actually shared an attic. Mm. So like they were death traps if a fire started. Right. This also wouldn't have gone over too well with the housing people. But every time they tried to check in with them to see if they could rehouse them, they were just told, yeah, we're looking into it. Like, don't worry. But they felt like as if they were just being laughed at. And one of John's theories was that they were actually trying to wait them out Mm -hmm. to see if they would just give up and move back in. Yeah. A few days later, they managed to get a little break. Someone John knew had a couple of mobile homes a little while away, south of the border, down Terman Feckin Way. What the fuck? That's the name of a town, yeah, Terman Feckin. It was in the Republic. Very exotic. It was by the beach, so they were all delighted. It sounded really nice, honestly, and they, they definitely all like needed the change. That Friday, John had to go back up to Belfast to collect money. And someone got in touch with him while he was there and said that they had seen an empty house that would be perfect for him and like the family. Totally empty. Like bare floors, no yeah. furniture whatsoever, nothing. But John got someone to mind it while he went and collected his family and brought them back to their new abode. So they were squatting, like, yeah, just taking over. And he said, like, he mentions it in the book. He's like, they were totally ashamed of this. Like, only a few months prior, they would have, like, looked down on people doing this. Yeah. But this was their situation. The kids were all excited about the new house and went around picking out new bedrooms and stuff like that. But John told them that they'd all be sleeping together in the living room for the time being. They were, like, just more or less camping, like, at this point. The kids went out to visit their friends and tell them all about like their new house and their little holiday that they were after having. And pretty soon, people started calling over once they saw that the kids were back. Some people were just being nosy, but others like brought stuff with them. They knew that all their possessions were in the old house and that that was a no go still. So they brought like someone brought a kettle and some cups. Someone brought curtains, bunk beds, mattresses, chairs. Someone had been minding their old TV. Like, I guess they didn't want to leave that behind with the woman. <laughs> so they gave it on loan to someone while they were... Like, fuck you, bitch. You get no entertainment. Yeah, yeah. I'm still of paying off this TV. <laughs> no way you're fucking getting it. Um, so anyway, they managed to get that back. So once again, like, they were overwhelmed by the goodwill of, like, their friends and neighbors. Even their new neighbors, like, the woman next door to them looked after them extremely well. She got a big thank you at the end of this book and all. But they had instantly taken just to helping them and like getting them settled in. And they finally felt like, shit, we have a house again. Mm. So life soon started to get back to normal. 
although they were all showing signs of like what they had gone through, mostly John. Greta was still suffering nightmares, but John's nightmares had kind of stopped and he had just taken to like sudden violent jerks. He would kick in his sleep and even when he was awake, he would just have like these random violent jerks, like his arms and legs just shoot out. Well, I mean, as like the fucking head injuries he's probably endured. Yeah, head injuries and just general fucking trauma. They also didn't like being alone in their new house. Like they were still very much on edge. So they had a constant flow of visitors still. Just not their families. Mm. Neither of their families were talking to them still. Yeah. Like they were just afraid of them. Even the sisters? Yeah. Nobody. Oh. They're very bitter about this. One night they get a knock on the door and they're surprised to find some of their old neighbors. Margaret that they had been living with was one of them. I think they were feeling a bit like they had just been abandoned. Like, they were still living very much in fear of this thing, even though the house itself had gone quiet. Like, they wanted John and Greta to go back into the house and basically check and see whether this thing was still there or not. Mm. Like, they were living their life on edge, and they felt like as soon as John and Greta got this new house, they were just like, all right, bye, okay, thanks. Like, thanks for housing our kids, housing yous, feeding yous, looking after your house. And then they just, like, split. So I don't think that was anybody's intention, Mm -hmm. but that's the feeling I got definitely when reading this. So the neighbors said that they wanted to know if the exorcism had worked. There is no mention of an exorcism anywhere in this book. Yeah. So I don't exactly know what, whether an official exorcism really took place or whether they like just word of mouth, somebody came up with this expression. I don't know. John and Greta were pretty pissed about just the fact that these people had come over and started like almost demanding that they go back and yeah. put themselves in danger. You know, two sides to every story and all that. And a bit of an argument sparked up, waking up the kids. John was, he said like they were shouting at one another and he said there was absolutely no way either of them were setting foot in that house again. Like the kids were all visibly upset just at the mention of it. Mm-hmm. Like, no way, Pedro, am I going back into that house. And neither is Greta. The neighbors explained that they not only felt abandoned, but I get the sense that they also felt, like, betrayed by John and Greta. John and Greta were at the center of all this, but where would they have been without all the people who had helped them? Their own families weren't even talking to them at this point because they were so scared. And they said people were starting to talk about about them. Saying like that they were ungrateful, basically. That's really dumb. Yeah. So Greta said she wouldn't have anyone talking about them behind their backs. At the door, I put the key in the lock and pushed it open. In we all went. No sooner had the last person cleared the doorstep when the door slammed shut behind us. For a moment, we all stood in the hall, uncertain as to what to do. When the door slammed, there had been a few screams from the others. But Greta and I just stared at each other. The nightmare was still here, still waiting to suck us in. I tried the door, but I couldn't get it open. While we all looked about, some bright spark, Margaret, suggested that they should take a look upstairs. I said nothing, hoping that everybody else would have the sense to say no. But to my horror, everyone agreed. I had the chance of either going upstairs or staying downstairs on my own. Before I made my decision, I tried the front door again. It was still solidly shut. Okay, I said, as I came back into the living room. Since we can't get out, we may as well go upstairs. But, since it was Margaret's idea to go, I think she should go first. I stayed close to Greta as we followed Margaret upstairs and made sure that we stayed close to the other two. When we got to the landing, I felt my nerves really beginning to go. It was all coming back to me. The first night when the bathroom door slammed and locked me in. The lady in black as she stood before me. How she had tried to put her hand between Greta and I as we prayed aloud on the landing. Most frightening of all was the moment when she threw me over the banisters and pulled me down by the ankles, banging my head on every step. I could actually see myself lying there at the bottom of the stairs with the woman standing over me. 
Before I could move, I saw Margaret getting pulled by the hair and being flung against the wall. She was lifted bodily and hurled down, screaming at the top of her voice. She landed heavily at the foot of the stairs. Sakina was in hysterics, crying and shouting for help. Then she too was pulled back and punched, driving her to the top of the stairs. It happened so quickly that I couldn't tell if she was picked up and thrown or whether she just slipped and fell. Whatever happened, she ended up with a bad fall. As I looked down into the hall, I could see that the front door had now opened and Margaret was out in the street. Sakina joined her and started to shout into the house for Jim to come. Jim, like me, was afraid to move. This thing was in front of us, blocking our way to the top of the stairs. We couldn't see anything, but we knew it was there. We could feel the coldness about us and the presence of the thing convinced us that the woman was still active. Jim suddenly grabbed hold of his head. I could tell from his movements that he was acting as if he was being punched on the head or pulled by the hair. He moaned in pain and then was suddenly pushed down the stairs. He thumped noisily down them into the hall. As for Greta, she wasn't hurt. Before she knew it, she was standing in the hall and to this day she still can't remember getting down the stairs. She does know one thing. She didn't come down the stairs willingly or unaided. So I was on my own at the top of the stairs. I couldn't see anything, but I knew she was there. I wondered what she had in store for me. The landing grew even more chilly. This was the worst cold yet felt. I had to make a decision. My left side felt like ice. She was very, very close. I darted for the stairs, but didn't make it. Something had the hold of my ankle. It pulled me to the floor and away from the top of the stairs. A fear came over me that this would be the death of me. This thing had its grip on me and wouldn't let go. I shouted for help, but I knew that it wouldn't come. The others were simply terrified. I felt the pressure on my chest. It felt as if someone was standing on me. It got so bad that I almost stopped breathing. The pain grew unbearable. Then the pressure eased, just as if this thing had stepped off me. I lay for a few seconds, my whole body frozen. I could feel a stinging sensation coming from the leg that had been grabbed. All of a sudden, I just said to myself, Fuck it, I'm getting out. I pulled myself up and tried to make it to the top of the stairs. Suddenly, something hit me on the side. It felt as if it was behind me, punching away at me, but I couldn't afford to let it stop me. When I reached the top of the stairs, I was pushed from behind. It wasn't an ordinary push. It felt as if there was a running crowd behind me and I was being forced along by their momentum. I went flying up into the air, only to land halfway down the stairs. When I landed, the jar of it seemed to shake my whole back with its full force. I kept on despite the pain. I reached the front door and lurched out into the street. Greta had lost a shoe and everything in the house, but they just said fuck it. They walked Margaret back home and then made their way back to their new house. John handed the keys of number 91 back to the housing people the very next day. This was not just a symbolic gesture because he felt as long as he had the keys, he also had the responsibility. He wasted no time putting pen to paper. He finished writing this book nine months after he handed back the keys. In that nine months, four other families had been housed in number 91. The last family moved in on a Monday and moved out the following day. Interestingly enough, when I was trying to find out more information on the subject, I came across talks of another haunting in Beachmount, in the Beachmount area. Reports of a headless nun, holy statues crying in schools nearby, supposedly bad omens not long before the trouble started with the IRA and that. The house was knocked down a few years after the book came out. I'm sure it wasn't just because of the lady, but I'm pretty sure it was knocked down in order to build new houses. I actually had a look on Google Maps. Like I found out which street the house was originally on. And it looks like the whole neighborhood like layout and everything is different now. Mm. But I'd be interested to know, like to find out if like shit is still going on there, you know? What I did they mention I can't remember any stories about what happened in the house before they had moved in? Nothing, but there was other reports from other neighbors and stuff. Also, 
after some nosing around on the Belfast Forum.co.uk, the general consensus what that was that John and his family were just all absolutely lovely. And for the most part, everyone believed them. According to one post there, uh, on there, Greta actually ended up in a wheelchair after one of these attacks. Now, I can't verify that. It could have been from something completely unrelated. But he also mentioned that she had like two black eyes and stuff like this. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it was even something to do with her asthma. You know what I mean? And she just looked really bad at the time. And I'm pretty sure that both John and Greta have passed since this story was written. Greta apparently passed sometime in the 90s and John only in the last few years. But the people in that forum were family members of the neighbors. And one in particular was like the sibling of the friend who John Jr. stayed with. It's all very cool just to see like that the story is very much alive in that community. Like the people are still trying to find out, you know, more details and saying like, oh, like this happened to me or that happened here, like close to the house and that kind of thing. And it obviously just had a huge impact. And yeah, so that's the story. All right, then. Well, drop a message to see or to say what you think of the episode. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter. If you have a story, email it to us at weeklycreep at gmail.com. And I think that's pretty much it. Do you have any? um... Yeah, if you follow us on or if you listen to us on iTunes or anything like that, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And yeah, if you are from that area, like David, who recommended this, big thanks to him again, because that was... Colorful. Yeah, that was probably the most interesting ghost story I've ever read, personally. Especially just in terms of the level of activity in it. Like, that was ridiculous. If you have any of your own stories, again, send them to the email this time. But yeah, feel free to drop us a a message and just let us know what you think. And yeah, next week we'll be back with Dulce telling us a story. Word. And yeah. All right, everybody. All right, bye. Bye. Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. Uh, I did not hit her. I did did not. not.